Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. There is still a lot going on over at Boca Chica, Texas in preparation of the first orbital test flight, plus more construction progress over at Starbase, Florida. We have a beautiful little update here on some robotic helpers on the International Space Station. As it heads towards retirement at the end of the decade, it is interesting to see this news here. Another batch of Starlink satellites this week, but more interesting was the re-entry footage. Some more sweet Mars updates, and China's massive launch vehicle carried its heaviest payload ever to orbit. Just what was happening here? Kicking off today with a few updates at SpaceX's production facility at Starbase, Texas. Firstly, Ship 25's partial tank section, consisting of its common dome and middle liquid oxygen section, was moved to the high bay last weekend to continue the stacking of that vehicle. Hopefully not too long now, until we see Ship 25 progress really start to ramp up. Now, the recent sighting of a ship methane header tank has been great to finally see. We've known for quite some time that the methane header tank had been moved from within the main tank up with the liquid oxygen header tank, but we just didn't know the exact layout of how these sat together. As shown beautifully by Chameleon Circuit, the methane header tank is a sphere hung by several linkages under the liquid oxygen header tank in the nose cone. Both of these header tanks have lines that run right down the length of the vehicle to the center engines for landing. On Tuesday, Booster 9's methane tank section was moved into the mega bay, leading us to believe that it was later stacked. However, that was not so, and it was instead wheeled out in front later that day, still six rings tall. That night, though, back in it rolled, and this time it was indeed stacked on a three ring section, making it nine out of 13 rings tall. So, yes, nice progress there. It has been a few weeks since updating you on the Star Factory, but new RGV aerial photography flight images have revealed that loads of roofing has now been done. It shouldn't be too long until the factory is at least partially usable. Heading over to the launch site, there is a bunch of neat things to talk about here. We can see that SpaceX is well underway repainting a fresh coat covering the top of the orbital launch mount. There is a lot of fire damage that has already been painted over, but the remains of the Raptor thermal protection system from Booster 7's explosion incident is visible here as well, most likely awaiting further analysis before being scrapped. Repairs are clearly still a work in progress across the launch mount in many areas, quite the cleanup still needed here. Now, I've had a bunch of you asking about the new orbital launch mount platform progress, but we haven't seen a great deal more at this stage. Based on a quick mock-up from O here, awesome to see you back in action by the way, you can see how this platform is inserted and then opened up to become a much wider platform. It will then be hooked up to the top of the mount to essentially become an elevator that can raise or lower as needed. Raptor engines and hardware can be loaded on, and up they go providing much greater access to what they currently have. If we head up to the very top of the Mechazilla Tower, we can see that SpaceX has been busy increasing the height of the structure on top to add what appears to be a weather station. Compared to this picture from two months ago, the change is quite obvious there, so SpaceX should have a very useful set of data points from this system. We have some other cool new insights for the tower. Starship Gazer tweeted out a series of photos showing that a lot of new work was being performed on the chopsticks, specifically a shock absorbing catch system. He confirmed that this system will adjust to cushion the impact when boosters and starships are caught by the arms. In fact, back in April, Lunar Caveman on Twitter mentioned that the vertical actuators were missing from the catching beams, which as of this week are being installed. There are mounting points on each beam for five actuators and the parallel linkages allow vertical travel of about three quarters of a meter. This new setup is going to allow the beams to move down quicker than the chopsticks themselves to absorb the impact of the booster touching down on those arms. Why it's taken so long to get to this point, I'm not so sure. Now, close by, the B7.1 test tank activity continued this week after a series of eventful tests the week prior, as covered in last week's video. 
On Monday, the Can Crusher cap straps were detached from pistons below, and the LR11000 crane hooked up and lifted it off. That wasn't the end for the little test tank though. On Tuesday, a new vent stack was installed on top, a strong indicator that the test tank was not yet done with additional testing to come. Remember, the last test tank was pushed to its limits, and such a vent stack was used in a similar setup during its explosive testing. So yes, that brought us to Wednesday. By 1pm, venting could be seen from those new top vents, and frost started to build up on the tank. After a series of opening and closing the vents, the frost started to recede, wrapping up that day of testing. So yes, after what seems a pretty successful test run, it was removed from the mount and was promptly rolled out onto Highway 4, up towards the build site. Ship 24 preparation for static fire has been well underway, and this is exciting because we haven't seen a static fire for a long time, not since those for Ship 20. Based on notices, we should be seeing that during the next week, so keep your eyes peeled there. In preparation for that round of testing, Ship 24's aft flaps were extended at around 4.30pm on Thursday, followed by the forward flaps a few hours later. So yes, this is super exciting. We are really getting very close now. At the Orbital Launch Farm, there's been quite a lot of work being done over the past week, especially around the berms to ensure the tank farm is protected. New pipework here arrived, which I suspect are upgrades for the propellant super chilling equipment, and we've seen methane pumps being moved around here too, so a bunch of upgrades are happening. You may recall me actually talking about the old methane tanks potentially being converted for another purpose. At the time, there wasn't a great deal of plumbing that we could really see to determine the exact plan. As sleuthed out by CSI Starbase, these two now seem to be designated as water tanks based on some great research into the recently reconfigured plumbing. These pipes are actually now suspected to be water pipes due to them being iron and not stainless steel like the cryogenic lines. Also, there is speculation here to suggest that the original water tank here may have had a number of leaks and issues, leading SpaceX to use the two methane tanks which were replaced by the horizontal tanks. Any Anyway, I've got a link to the full video here, so if you want a much more detailed breakdown, check that out and give Zach a follow there on Twitter. As I continuously try to drive home each week, your support for the community is so helpful just as it is for my channel here. Collectively, this team keeps growing and providing such amazing access and insight, so thank you. Now we head all the way over to Starbase, Florida. Last week I talked about the tower catch arms or chopsticks here being constructed that appear shorter than the ones at Starbase in Texas, and this certainly turned into one of the more interesting comment threads. I don't like to speculate too much on the reasoning behind what we see when there is zero evidence to support it. Many out there are assuming that because these arms are shorter that they won't be used for catching only lifting. I don't really think this is true. I suspect like everything, SpaceX are just refining the design and optimizing it. Shorter arms require less material to make, it means less load on the ends of the arms, and all of that means that the arms themselves can move even faster. If SpaceX can get the landing perfected, shorter arms are really not a problem. In NASA Spaceflight's latest flyover covering the area this week, there are a few things to add to last week though. Firstly, we can see that the two pillars have arrived for the ninth tower component, which does indeed show that it will be the short top section. That also confirms the tower at 39A should be roughly the same height as the one at Starbase. Progress continues on those shorter arms, and as well on the ship quick disconnect arm seen here. SpaceX was at the time of the flight preparing to roll out the fifth section of the launch tower that you can see here, which is the section that the ship quick disconnect arm attaches to, as shown nicely here by Lolo Matico 3D. That was rolled out as captured yet again by Spaceflight Now, and Greg Scott was also on the scene there as well. That was stacked up in just the last day, with Section 6 I believe heading out early next week. That will certainly, I think, require the crane to be extended at this point. We are well over halfway now. Over at 39A, we can even see more rings being constructed for the speculated water tower. Looking very closely, it appears that the top of the circular platform is very close to being ready for the rings to be mounted on top. I'm really looking forward to seeing if this all comes together the way that we expect that it will. I think though, one very neat insight talked about in the video here by Jack is that Blue Origin appears to have a Stage 2 test tank for the new Glen Rocket out on display here painted white, branded with the logo. 
window. We missed that in the last flyover, so nice one there, NASA Spaceflight. I would love to see some information from Blue Origin on what they are planning to do here. SpaceX and their Starlink launch frequency continues in overdrive with yet another launch. The mission this time saw flight proven Falcon 9 booster 1062 ready to go from Launch Complex 39A, the same booster that sent Inspiration 4 into orbit. Liftoff here was just after 8.30am local time, and with that launch, number 33 for 2022 was underway, this being the booster's eighth flight. Carrying another 53 broadband internet satellites to orbit, it really is amazing when you think back to when this all began. Now, Starlink is available in 36 countries, as Musk mentioned just recently. I have to say, these launches really are just ridiculously routine now, and I mean that as a huge compliment to SpaceX and how they do their launches. Some great vision of aerodynamic pressures at play here on Ascent, and also captured beautifully in this still image here by the amazing Greg Scott. So yes, it was time here for main engine cutoff and stage separation, shortly followed by fairing jettison. While the second stage continued on its merry way, the booster return was epic to watch. Just check out the accelerated footage of the approach angle here, with the booster looking like it is almost horizontal, passing through the cloud layer. Just seconds later, there it was, back onto the deck of the drone ship, a shortfall of gravitas. Just another bullseye landing on a platform, bobbing up and down in the ocean. No big deal, right? As for payload deployment. Sadly, this webcast ended shortly after, as it has done with many others recently, and only a brief pre-deployment glimpse here. Successful deployment was eventually confirmed, of course, on Twitter afterward. Another milestone for Relativity Space with their first full hot fire video shared here. Step by step, we are approaching that first launch of Terran 1. And speaking of engine tests, Blue Origin released this neat video showing the throttle control of the BE-4. A pretty neat way to display that actually. You can see the exhaust move back and forth with the throttle change, which ranges between 45 and 100%. Now, I can't help but have a little fun with this one, so beware, the following segment comes with a dad joke warning. And yes, things were certainly a buzz at NASA recently with the announcement that the Astro B robots aboard the International Space Station were carrying out activities on their own for the first time. I mean, I don't want to drone on about it, but I for one could not be happier. <laughs> okay, I'll knock that off. So this little clip right here shows the first time that two Astro Bs have worked independently independently alongside humans in separate modules of the orbiting outpost. This one named Bumble up the back here tested its navigation abilities in the Harmony module and collected new station mapping data. Meanwhile, the green one, Queen, captured its first 360 degree panoramic image of the interior. So what exactly is all this about Astro B, you may ask? Well, back in 2018, the docking station was delivered and installed in the Kibo module. The autonomous helpers move about with the aid of impellers and they are designed to return here in order to recharge. For about a decade prior to this, you may recall the SPHERES robots were active research test beds. In April of 2019, two of three Astro B robots named Bumble and Honey arrived aboard the International Space Station. Here we see NASA astronaut Anne McLean performing a series of tests on Bumble, the first unit to be activated. Around three months later, Queen arrived, seen here with NASA astronaut Megan MacArthur. With the working hours for the astronauts packed with activities, these little helpers here are designed to assist with chores like inventory, documenting experiments, and moving cargo. However, these cube bots are also valuable for testing algorithms. Say that you've got a satellite that has run out of propellant but is otherwise perfectly okay. Using Astro B, scientists can better understand how to possibly develop a method of safe capture. In February of 2022, Further testing was done to simulate an autonomous rendezvous with one cube acting as a tumbling target and the other as a chaser looking for a point on its surface to mate with. The practical applications of these robots even extends to future spacecraft. For example, the Lunar Gateway is not expected to be crewed all year round. We could well see advanced versions of these smart autonomous robots keeping an eye on these systems, so the evolution of all this is very cool to watch. 
Now, speaking of the ISS, Yuri Borisov has wasted no time as the new boss at Roscosmos. Media reports this week began circulating on Tuesday that Russia will end its cooperation on the ISS after 2024. Now, granted, that is a pretty vague timeline because after 2024 could mean anything, but it has been known for some time that this has always been on the cards. The White House announcement last year stating its intention to extend operations on the ISS up to 2030 was a move in endorsed by all the key stakeholders at the time, except for Russia. So while NASA had no official notification of this development at the time, this appears to be the first indication of a formal step by Russia to go their own separate way. Elon here on social media with a nice farewell message. The ISS has provided a habitat for sustained human presence in low Earth orbit now for over 20 years, so it is certainly showing its age. It's destined to of course be decommissioned sometime around 2030, and NASA awarded contracts to three companies, of course, to develop commercial space station solutions that can take over at that point. For the immediate future, though, in a totally separate arrangement, Axiom Space has already been granted access to user port to install several modules, possibly as soon as two years from now. This tweet midweek here showing the production progress of two of Axiom's modules. They are certainly not messing around there, and it is super encouraging to see all of this coming together. Now, some really cool updates from Mars too. I just had to show you these amazing images taken by ESA's Mars Express. This is Valles Marineris, 4,000 kilometers long, 200 wide, and up to seven deep. And it is just monstrous, by far the largest structure of its type in the entire solar system as far as we know. About 20 times wider and five times deeper than the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon. This 3D terrain model here has the image data mapped over it to give this simulated view. Now, it has been 17 months since the Perseverance rover successfully landed, and it has already traveled over 11 kilometers on the Martian surface. Just to put things into perspective, Curiosity has only traveled around 28 since its landing nine years ago. So yeah, Perseverance is smashing out the milestones. Now, recently, this image taken by it went viral. You can see a string-like tangled object, and with that comes some hilarious conspiracy theories. But it is not as mysterious as that. It's most probably just a piece of the rover's parachute or strings that connect it. The rover is not really very far away from the landing site, and the material even looks light enough to get carried away by Martian winds. In June, Perseverance also found this piece of a thermal blanket, which helped it land as well. So yes, that was just stuck in a Martian rock. Now, the future of the mission to return its samples to Earth has taken a nice positive turn this week with NASA sharing this updated plan. Perseverance will now bring samples to the lander where a robotic arm provided by ESA will load them into an ascent vehicle. Due to that, the Mars sample return campaign is no longer going to include the sample fetch rover or its associated second lander. Instead, two Ingenuity class helicopters will be added as backups. I think it's cool that we now have a term called Ingenuity Class. Now, speaking of Mars, our amazing sponsor today got started making parts for the Mars rover along with the International Space Station. Yep, you've probably heard the name Henson Shaving. If so, you may already know that these talented engineers went from building aerospace equipment to making the Henson Razor. In the past, I've done what I assume most of us do, repeatedly picking up some expensive plastic razor at the supermarket, wondering how on earth this thing could possibly cost what it does. Then, after a handful of uses, it is dull, and you're throwing the cartridge away to do it all over again. Well, Henson Shaving sent me one of theirs to check out, and not only is this an incredible solid razor, it is completely plastic-free, including the packaging. It's actually made using CNC machines to aerospace standards, so a really solid construction, and it's built so accurately with tolerances so precise that the blade only extends past the shave plane less than the thickness of a human hair. It almost seems impossible to cut yourself with it. At the same time, it holds the blade at a recommended 30 degree angle for the perfect shave. It's super easy to use, and it avoids irritation and razor burn. The cost savings over time really add up too. These blades are only 10 cents each, and are of course 100% recyclable. In fact, if you want to give it a try, enter the code Marcus at checkout, and they will send 100 blades for free in addition to the razor in your preferred color. Just head to HensonShaving.com to upgrade your shaving experience to aerospace grade. 
Now, last Sunday, China successfully launched their second core module, Wentian, as they continued to build their own space station. Everything looked to have gone to plan, with the module docking successfully some 13 hours or so later. This launch was a particularly notable achievement for them as it represented their heaviest launch at 23 metric tons. This module also comes with a robotic arm for external experiments and an additional airlock for spacewalks as well. This station, I think, has just come together at an incredible speed. Only back in April of 2021, the first core module of the space station was launched into orbit, and that was just the first of 11 planned missions including crewed, uncrewed, and supply missions to build the space station out. They aim to complete the assembly around October of this year. This second module, Wentian, is the laboratory segment, and it's going to provide room to conduct varied science experiments in zero gravity. The three Chinese Taikonauts currently living and working in the core module activated the life support, power, and other essential systems to begin the installation before finally entering in. So yes, that was a lot of interesting stuff to cover this week. Not so much launch activity, but so much other stuff. What do you think? Did I miss something though? Let me know. And if I have earned your subscription today, welcome to the crazy pace of space news. Now, the other day, we released our midweek video diving right into the plan for NASA's Artemis lunar missions as they work with SpaceX towards the ultimate missions to Mars. Very big thanks to all of the patrons and YouTube supporters specifically for the assistance with those. The link is right here if you would like to join our great community and support all of these, and likewise our merch link too if you'd like one of these Mars Here We Come shirts. That video is here in the bottom left, and on the right other deep dive videos that you may have missed. Thanks a heap for watching all this way through, that helps a massive amount. Have an awesome week, and I'll catch you next Saturday.